Dead on Your Feet, Arthur Grant Michaels, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1993. Stan Krejcik Mystery, Book 3, Narrator Eric Ost. In memory of Tajana and Andre, with gratitude and respect and love, thanks to the patience and generosity of my friends. Chapter 7 for the one I love. The next morning, Rafik was scheduled to teach company class at the ballet, so we were both up early. While he showered and filled the apartment with his steamy scent of wild fern, I fixed our breakfast to the strains of an old Fanny Bryce song about the very scene of domestic bliss we were depicting at that moment. The big difference was that I wasn't making hot meal for Rafik, but French toast. As I moved about the small kitchen, singing along and swinging my hips and shoulders to the lively beat of the music, Sugar Baby watched me wearily from atop one of the ta tall stools. I'd placed everything on the kitchen counter when her feet came into the kitchen, all ready and moist and cleanly shaven, wearing a white cotton t-shirt hanging outside his khaki chinos and bulky white socks on his feet. Rafik never came to the table bare-chested with his eagle's beak of a nose. He surveyed the kitchen air, which I had managed to fill with the happy morning smells of coffee and browned butter and crusty grilled bread. Delicious, he said after a deep breath. But to my nose, the real treat was the scent what, that Rafik had brought into the kitchen with his scrubbed skin and his damp hair redundant of wild forest, forest greenery. I opened my arms to him, and we embraced like two virgins who had just spent their first night together. Sugar Baby watched as us wrapped in each other's arms. She cocked her feline face one way, then the other, then said, Quow! Though my girl's vocabulary may be limited, the message is always clear. When are you going to feed me? Ever bre over breakfast, I told Rafik that I needed to talk with people at the Boston City Ballet Studios, especially the ones who'd been at Max Harkey's dinner the other night, if I was going to make any headway in getting Tony Di Natale out of jail. Rafik agreed to help me any way he could, but then he added, You will show discretion, of course. I promised that I would. Try, that is. We finished eating, and Rafik departed for the BCB, even the... Ever the dutiful spouse, I cleaned up the dishes and got myself ready to face the day after feeding my favorite cat. When I got to Snips, I took Nicole into my office and related the turn of events to her. As usual, her response was blunt. I disapprove, I shrugged. I got to do it, doll. How can you think that meddling in a murder case is going to solve your romantic problems? The ones you've created yourself, I might add? It's the only way I can be sure of Rafik's love. She shook her head in disdain. I went on. Last night we had sex, Nikki. So? It was strange, almost troubling. Nicole said, Maybe you should consult a newspaper columnist about it. Everyone else seems to. No, Nikki, it was different this time. I felt more than I ever had before. Bosh! Felt what? I can't explain. Some kind of shift. Stanley, what are you talking about? A shift where? Everywhere. Nowhere. She shook her head ruefully. Dear boy, you should be happy that your lover is still finding ways to thrill you instead of trying to analyze what's happening. Doll, I'm telling you, this was different. I didn't even come at least not in the usual way. It was as though it all happened inside me, but not physically. Are you telling me that you now understand the way a woman feels? Not since a woman have been learning how to ejaculate. What I'm questioning is whether Rafik and I have finally transcended our bodies to experience a more elevated kind of sex. One born in the soul. Have we finally surpassed the limits of physical love? Nicole took a few sips of her cream-laced coffee. Darling... You'll forgive me, but I have no idea what you're talking about. If you're not sure how you feel about Rafik, maybe you should look for the answer within yourself rather than setting up the test between him and that woman. You're basing your whole future with him on whether he passes or fails this arbitrary little quiz you've invented. It's not like that, Nikki. I have to know if Rafik wants me 
for love, for who I am myself, unconditionally? Or am I just a plaything? I know I'm not perfect. I'm not even intelligent most of the time, but this feels like one of those small opportunities to discover some bit of truth about my life. It sounds like a house of cards to me. It may be, I replied with a sad little sigh. But just for the record, I promised to stack the deck in Rafik's favor. Disregarding my bad pun, Nicole said, And just for the record, Stanley, I think you're courting disaster. So be it. What about your work here at the salon? I already do a lot of the office work after hours. So you've worked everything out? Hardly, I said. Nicole finished her coffee, then got up and went toward the door. She turned back to me and said, I suppose as a friend I ought to offer you any help I can in your quest for the grail. Thanks, doll. She shook her head dubiously. Good luck then, she said, and closed the door. I finished some of the urgent business I had on my desk, then left the salon a few hours later. When I got to the studios of the Boston City Ballet, I saw that the police were finishing up their work and were just leaving the building. I entered through the main doorway where Lieutenant Branko saw me and waved me over to him. You're looking lively today, he said. Things must be back on track at home. Then he raised one eyebrow as if to end his simple statement with a question mark. Things are just fine, Lieutenant, I replied with a caustic edge in my voice. To counter Branko's presumptuous attitude and his bull's eye accuracy about my personal life, he said, I'd like to have a little talk with you at the station when you have a chance. A casual invitation to questioning by a cop is not exactly standard procedure, so I wondered what was on his mind. I've got some time now, I said. Brinko replied. But I don't. I can't wait. But do it soon. Then he left the building, the last cop to walk out the door. I headed up the broad staircase to the main reception area, taking the steps two at a time with my strong Slavic legs. Up there I found small groups of dancers and company, staff milling about in the expansive skylit area. Through the general hum of voices I heard one penetrate through, all the rest with its unmistakable shrill staccato. Then I saw Madame Levinskaya chattering nervously to a young man in sweat-dampened workout clothes, seated on the floor, drinking coffee and eating a hard-boiled egg. Obviously a dancer. Boy, she! muttered the old woman to him. They are asking too many questions. Too much! Too much! Madame Levskaya's magpie complaining must have wearied the young man because he glanced up at me with eyes full of hope as though I might rescue him from humoring the old woman any longer. Madame had sensed my presence as well, either from the young man's look toward me or from the physical energy of my approach. For she turned and faced me with her watery pale blue eyes. Finally, you are coming, she said with great relief. Rafi says you will help us. Take cud. I hope I can, I said. You must, she said, raising her voice to a hen-like squawk. The police are making many questions, but giving not one answer. I want to know who did that to Maxi. Who can be such a monster? Madame then threw her head back and raised her wrist to her forehead, her eyes closed and mouth a gap in cliché pantomime from 19th century melodrama. She moaned in a quietly descending glissando that ended with a slight gasp. I don't know why what she intended by the gestures, but they elicited neither sympathy nor even a suppressed smile in me. Instead, they produced an unsettling sense of deception, and I wondered what she was hiding. I recalled the night of the dinner party when she and Max Harkey had openly disagreed on some programming change that he had proposed in connection with her young niece. Madame had left the party immediately after that episode. She had claimed to be tired, but she was clearly more angry than spent. Could that small disagreement, which so many people had witnessed, have motivated the old woman to kill Max Harkey? It seemed unlikely. It wasn't important enough. Her voice broke into my meandering thoughts. So, she said. I saw that she had recovered her composure, probably because her antiquated acting had had so little effect on me. Ravik is rehearsing now. She pointed toward a wide carpeted corridor off the main lobby. You will find him there. 
I was about to explain that I hadn't been looking for Rafik at all, but she had turned and was walking away in the opposite direction. I stood there stupidly wondering how to get her back, but no ideas came. Nancy Drew had had a lobotomy. Though I hadn't intended to visit Rafik, I headed in that direction Madame Radinskaya had indicated. Perhaps the sight of my beloved would inspire me to more successful investigative techniques to emulate my true hero, Perry Mason. Perhaps if I lay low, I might even catch a glimpse of the new choreography Rafik was being so secretive about. Sure enough, one of the curtains that usually closed off the long viewing windows of the rehearsal studio had been left partially open. A six-inch gap allowed me to spy unseen by anyone inside. Rafik was demonstrating some elaborate movements to Scott Malloy and Elisa Cortland. The two dancers were in leotards and tights. While Rafik was in his t-shirt and khaki chinos, I watched him shape the air with his strong arms and legs and torso. Mold it with the same love and conviction as a master sculptor. Every line and gesture he made seemed to push beyond the confines of his body and extended outward to infinity. Inspired by his dream world, he m moved. Then forced by the limits of the real world, he would freeze the movement and clarify his intention to the two dancers. They nodded in assent. While they imitated Rafik's moves in miniature, then Rafik would return to the ethereal realm and once again redefine the space around him, only to stop mid-pose and explain some more. Creating art seemed to be a cosmic version of Simon Says, alternating between divine force and mundane response. The mundane had its intriguing elements, though. Scott Malloy's body, for example, since he was in his early 20s, his soft tissue structures, muscles, tendons, and ligaments were all at the peak of electricity. For an adult, no matter how high he soared in a jump or how many tours he completed in a parade, when he finished the move and returned to Earth, he made no vibration, no sound beyond that of his kid skin, slippers, flexing through the ply his pliable feet back onto the floor. Next to the younger man, Rafik's physical maturity was more evident. His muscularity had filled out with the proportions of a man, while Scott Malloy retained the slight imbalance of extremely developed calves and thighs and buttocks, supporting a slender, boyish torso. It gave him an odd vulnerability, as though he hadn't grown up yet, but was expected to do adult things with his body. And where, when Rafik told Scott Malloy what to do, he obeyed unflinchingly. Elisa Cortland's face was beautiful, but inexpressive, as if cut from met marble. It was at once captivating and disturbing. Her body was neither girlish nor womanly. By some aberration of genetics, it resembled an exotic asexual humanoid that had been trained to perform ballet. When she stood at rest, watching Rafik, she appeared ungainly and almost grotesque. But when Elisa Cortland put her body into motion or into a pose, she became a piece of living sculpture breathtaking and mesmerizing, the lines of which no ordinary mortal would ever assume. She was a ballerina machine of which Rafik was the virtuoso operator. Watching Rafik create his art on these two rare specimens of Homo sapiens, I wondered about my own work in the salon, though in pursuit of another kind of beauty, it seemed pedestrian compared to Rafik's attempts at pure expression. I've tried to accept these vast differences in our work, yet I can't comprehend why any act of creation has to exact such a heavy toll from the person behind doing it. My work is creative, but a major project for me means a few hours of concentrated work and then it's over. I'm happy, the client is happy, and it's on to the next one. For Rafik, though, creating a piece of choreography can take months. Often, many long moody months, yet the finished work might be a series of movements and poses that however grandly eloquent or playfully light-hearted, might last only 10 or 12 minutes on stage, and the emotional distance that appears during those dark months of creation might trouble me gravely, especially since Rafik, the creator, is such a contrast to other side of him, the generous, mischievous lover, the man who, a patriot to the end, once hummed the national anthem on the 4th of July while juggling my testicles within his cheeks. With that fond memory, I turned away from the rehearsal studio and went back to the main lobby, returning by a different corridor. I made an unlikely discovery along the way. 
The new studio is now housed a fully equipped workout room, complete with stair climbers, sky simulators, and stationary bicycles, barbells, dumbbells, and cam-driven weight machines, and the requisite walls of mirrors. I wondered, would the vision that possessed artists like Rafik ultimately be vanquished by the health club mentality? Would bal balletic ideals of form and motion evolve into nothing more than the athletic prowess of a jock? A super fine exhibitionist produced in the name of art? That the workout faculty was vacant offered some hope that art might yet exist outside the gym. I was passing through the main lobby on my way out of the building, already discouraged by my lack of progress, when I heard a voice call out to me. Hello there! It was Marshall Xander. How are you doing today? He said. As well as anybody after a day like yesterday. He nodded as though he understood me completely. It's hard to believe it happened at all. He appeared relaxed and rested, and I commented on that. He smiled broadly and replied, It's an illusion. I'm on medication. It's the only way I could face this catastrophe. When the time is right, I'll confront my grief. Sometimes it's best to yield to emotions as they happen. I don't think I could survive it, he said with a jocular laugh. Whatever his doctor had prescribed was certainly effective, far from the weepy hysteria and accusatory outburst of yesterday morning. Marshal Xander today was as carefree as a vacationer returning from an island paradise. Either that, or perhaps this man had no feelings to confront or surrender to or survive. He asked me, Are you here to see Rafik? No, I said. I'm trying to find out more about Max's death. He narrowed his eyes momentarily, then blinked twice as if to expel a moat of worry that even his drugs couldn't block. Are you working for the police then? He said with a small, vague laugh. Not for, not against, I said in addition to. I see, he said with an approving nod. Good luck then. Sorry, I can't talk any longer. Board of Directors meeting. Kind of an emergency. Maybe we'll meet again? I'm sure we will, I said. Marshal Xander was about to leave, but then he added, By the way, about yesterday? Yes. I'm afraid I behaved badly towards you and said some things I didn't mean. It happens sometimes in extreme situations. Still, I didn't mean to implicate Rafiq. He is devoted to you. I hope so. I don't really believe he's involved with Antonia. You know who I mean? I nodded, he said. It was probably just panic and confusion. I nodded again. I mean, I didn't actually see them doing anything, though they did look guilty when I arrived. Then again, I probably imagined everything. Except for Max's body, I said, hoping to break through Marshal Zandl's drug-induced vacuity. I wanted to challenge him to make him face the death of his friend instead of running from it. Aren't there moments in life when grief should be met head-on and not avoided? Yet we invented fantastic psychic machinery to protect ourselves from such horrors as finding a person we claim to love laid open and bled to death. Marshal Xander shuddered, then I saw on his face a sorrow that no narcotic short of a sledgehammer could suppress. I guess I'd succeeded in putting him in touch with his feelings, but for whatever good it did either of us. Just then Scott Malloy came into the lobby. He put on extra tight blue jeans and an oversized shirt of brushed cotton, twill unbuttoned down the front to show the top part of his le leotard. Still wet with the exertions of Rafik's rehearsal, the snug denim covering his legs and haunches, and the loose cannon shirt around his torso tended to reproportion his boyish physique. Now he looked like a young man, a very desirable young man. Seeing Scott, Marshal Xander quickly recovered his composure. There's someone I'd watch out for, he said with a mistrustful look toward Scott. He's a nice dancer, I replied flatly, hoping my fiend lack of interest might encourage him to elaborate on his comment. It worked. Scott would never admit he was in love with Max, he said, and it was so obvious to both Max and myself that it often amused us. For very different reasons, obviously. Meaning, I ventured. Marshal Xander smiled a melancholy little smile. Max was heterosexual. I am not and Scott is entangled in his own precarious and moralistic doubts. It's too bad when people do that. It creates trouble for everyone around them. I felt myself redden with embarrassment. Marshal Xander's words reminded me of my own appalling insecurities, and his simple insight made me wonder if there was more to him 
than the bumbling nebbish. I got that meeting, he said abruptly, and he was off. Again, I stood as though stuck in a mud, watching Marshal Xander depart in one direction and Scott Malloy in the other. I seized the moment and followed the young dancer's tightly clad buttocks out into the early afternoon sunlight. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.